Good evening and welcome to another edition of Arizona Wildlife View. I'm your host, Ian Satter. On tonight's show, we take a look at the backbone of the Arizona Game and Fish Department, the unsung heroes who consistently get the job done. Man has had his hands all over the earth for thousands of years, but hasn't learned that we're just visitors passing through. So we view our volunteer work as kind of a rent payment for the accommodations enjoyed by our family during our brief stay here. What we enjoy is the opportunity to meet a lot of great people, seeing the smiles on the faces of both youth and adults when they learn something or try something new, watching a wildlife project go from concept to a finished, usable product that actually benefits wildlife. There is nothing like teaching the public about wildlife. Watching adult eagles nurture the eggs, the nestlings wobbling around, and finally taking that first flight is amazing and getting to hold one while banding them is the most exciting part of all. My family and I have had such wonderful experiences that came from hunting, fishing, camping, and just being in the outdoors in general that I feel a responsibility to give back to this way of life. It's about what we leave behind so we're building more than just water tanks. We're building traditions. Traditions that our kids will remember and pass down to their kids. I enjoy helping the biologists with their projects because the work is very interesting. A rolling thunder makes way across our land. It's a thunder created by thousands of pairs of boots hitting the rough trails. It's an army on a mission. The vision they have is firmly embraced by all. But this volunteer's army's weapons of choice are rakes and shovels a lot harder than. and even plastic bags. Young and old alike roll up their sleeves and get their hands dirty. Their ultimate goal, their vision, the reason they volunteer, wildlife. Individuals volunteer for the agency is because they are interested in what the agency does. And everyone who calls me or uh, stops in to see me or emails me who is interested in volunteering, they are excited about what the agency does. Found one. Here is the tiniest shell I have ever seen, but it is an amber now. And they are, are really interested in learning more and that's one of the benefits I think for volunteers is they can learn more about the agency and about what we do, some of the important issues that we're working on. Uh, the Knab Amber Snail is an, our only endangered snail in Arizona. It was listed as endangered in 1992. And in return we learn a lot from our volunteers. We learn what's important to them, their thoughts and feelings on different wildlife issues. I just want to reiterate here that uh, this is a growing problem. Uh, we've had some areas that we've cleaned up in October that I'm getting feedback from guys coming back now that are telling me that it's just as bad um, or worse and in a matter of a couple of months. And that's just the beginning. Consider how much good can be accomplished in one weekend by a hundred volunteers or a thousand. It's just awesome to see the type of energy that goes into this project and what people can bring and how we can accomplish things. And I think we increase the amount of work they can do by 20 times or something like that, like you're saying. And so it's great for our program, it's great for the people, and it really is, I mean, it's fun. <laughs> it really is a lot of fun being out here. And it's, it's always good at the end of the day when you go home sore. And you're just like, well, I just had a great time and I really worked hard and, and contributed to a good conservation cause. We have a diversity of projects that uh, volunteers work on also. Um, everything from volunteer instructors for our hunter education. Do not load your firearms, but at this time you may pick them up. Our boating education classes, um, shooting sports, uh, sport fishing programs. The chance to teach people to have fun while hunting, fishing and boating safely 
is a task coveted by hundreds of volunteers. The instructors are cool. They like help a lot. These soldiers will log over 50,000 hours in a single year. Also at our Ben Avery shooting facility, uh, we have a lot of assistance from volunteers. And at our uh, wildlife center, our rehabilitation center, we have many volunteers that assist in that area. A growing area of volunteer work comes from habitat restoration and cleanup projects. Due in large part to summer temperatures, most of these efforts are concentrated in the spring and fall. But volunteers can experience the satisfaction of a job done well at any time of the year. We have projects everywhere throughout the state, from southern Arizona to the deserts of Yuma, up into the pine country, and all different areas of the state. And I was in southern Arizona at the time and did a lot of work around the Sonora area. And uh, the first time I went out, I, just, I was just invited, so I just went out for the trip to see what it all involved. And, uh, you know, I met a, was a great group of people. The sheer numbers of volunteers fielded by sportsmen's groups across Arizona is staggering. We usually like to get involved in as many volunteer things as we can because it not only does it put the word out about the club but it just it really helps bring a little bit of unity to all the groups as well. And the groups read like a who's who in the outdoor. Working within the community and helping the community is something that's historically sportsmen have done. I mean it's one of the fortes of the sportsman's community. And I think it's something that not only the Game and Fish needs to encourage but Sportsmen's groups themselves need to encourage it. But one doesn't need to be a member of a sporting club to help out. We have uh, families who come out on weekends and volunteer. In addition, we have college students that help the agency. Some of those students are interested in uh, future employment with the agency, so they get out on weekends and during the week when they can to help the agency. The NAU chapter, student chapter of the Wildlife Society is um, uh, chapter that is part of the National Wildlife Society and we're out here today to um, try to cut down some of the young junipers that are encroaching on our grasslands which are um, crucial habitat for the uh, the pronghorn here in the area they're on a on a declining population slope right now <laughs> we even have folks who come from as far away as Sweden I think it's beautiful it's very much drier than in Sweden looking to experience a little part of the Wild West and helping our wildlife in the process I'm doing it because I want to because I was going to America anyway, and um, I found this project on the internet, and I thought it, yeah, it sounded cool, like a, an adventure, doing something different and, and doing something good as well at the same time. So we have just uh, about everyone you can think of who's interested in volunteering with the agency. Even the kids jump at the chance to help. Boy and Girl Scout troops have a long and distinguished history of volunteering for wildlife projects. We have scouts who are either interested in working as a group on uh, certain projects or an individual Eagle Scout who is interested in um, working with the department to do his, uh, his scout project. Today we're digging three drinkers for the wildlife. I got three different groups out here. They're installing a 20-foot section of 20-inch PVC pipe that holds the water. They're seeing that it's remote. They're, uh, they're feeling the heat a little bit. They're feeling the dryness. They can see how dry the, and, and dusty the soil is. And uh, I think that helps them understand how valuable waters are in the first place. And the water drains from the tank back to a drinker with a float valve on it, so it automatically fills up. I picked this project because I like being outside. I thought this would be a good place to go. It would benefit a lot of people. And I wanted to do it through the Game and Fish Department. But we get to visit about the wildlife here. And, and it, I think they go away with more than just the work that they've done and the, and the feeling of accomplishment, but with an education. Yeah, it's gotta be, uh... so whenever you're on a shotgun range, you always keep your safety glasses on all the time. For many of our okay. programs, including boating instructors and hunter education instructors, we prefer volunteers who have a little bit of experience. There is an orientation and we will train individuals as needed. People who will be working with children or are the sole instructor in a class may undergo a thorough background check 
and we make it easy to volunteer. Simply log on to the department's webpage. That's azgfd.gov forward slash volunteer for information about upcoming opportunities. And some of these opportunities are species specific. Choose your favorite critter and somewhere, sometime, we'll have a project for you. We drive around all night. Lots of people think we're completely nuts with spotlights at about two to five miles an hour, um, hanging out the window with the cold wind blowing through, shining our lights across the prairie, looking for the most brilliant green you've ever seen. That's what a ferret's eyes look like in the spotlights. It's, it's a jade like you've just never seen before. But it, it's, just, it's just a kick, and it's such a privilege to be able to participate in this kind of an opportunity where you actually get to put something back, where you get to do something right. You know, we, we mess up a lot of things as humans, but sometimes we do things that are really, really right, and this is one of those things. We really can't say enough about our cadre of volunteers. Without them, the department would never be able to accomplish its mission to conserve, enhance, and restore Arizona's diverse wildlife resources and habitats. The department salutes those weekend warriors who work for the good of everyone to help assure the future yet to come. This world is our home And while we're passing through We need to find a future Where our children can live too We need men and women Whose priorities are strong Making this a better place for us to carry on Some take for granted The things we can't replace We'll never do enough Until it's gone without a dream Kiss my ass Only then we ask ourselves The department is indebted to all the volunteers who work for the good of the land, but one group is celebrating its 50th anniversary. So let's enjoy a piece of cake with our hunter education instructors. Which activity would you guess is safer, hunting or driving your car to the store? Well, it might surprise most non-hunters to know the answer is hunting is safer. 
In 2004, Arizona had 1,151 fatal motor vehicle accidents. Only three hunting-related accidents happened in the state during each of the last two years. None were fatal. Hunting is one of the safest outdoor recreation activities in Arizona, and one of the main reasons is the Arizona Game and Fish Department's Hunter Education Program, which celebrated its 50th anniversary in 2005. The program relies on dedicated volunteers who teach a curriculum of firearm safety, hunter ethics, wildlife conservation principles, first aid, and a lot more. The program, which started in 1955, saw 400 students complete the course in its first year. Today, the Arizona Game and Fish Department offers more than 175 hunter education classes and certifies almost 5,000 students each year with the help of 800 volunteer instructors. Arizona's safety record over the years has been exemplary and its program has been nationally recognized and has served as a model for other states and even other countries. Keeping Arizona hunters safe for 50 years. Congratulations to the Hunter Education Program. Like most of our volunteers, our hunter education instructors insist it's not about them. It's about safety in the field. So here's a brief message in their honor. A fall quail hunt can be a very pleasant experience. Walking in the open air, a dog working the brush, and the camaraderie of friends. It all adds up to create a sport that men and women look forward to each year. A primary tool in the sport is the firearm you will be using. Although hunting as a whole is a very safe sport, special precautions in the field should be taken to ensure that it remains safe. Last winter, we were Mern's quail hunting with Michael Shea, an experienced professional shooter. Mike hunts a lot and passes on some time-tested strategies for staying safe in the field. First and foremost, pay attention to how you carry your firearm. We are working with pointing dogs today, so there is no need to walk around with a loaded shotgun. When we're hunting with, with pointing dogs, I like to work with the gun open at all times because you've got plenty of time to come up on the dog on his point, be able to load your gun, get it closed, and then get in position. Now, you may not be hunting with pointing dogs all the time. If you're working with flushers or maybe after dove, you may need to be loaded and ready to shoot. If so, follow this simple rule. But when I'm hunting over flushers, obviously you're going to have the, uh, the gun closed and you always want to make sure you're walking with the safety on and your finger outside of the trigger guard. That way you can't possibly, if you slip and fall or whatever, you're always in a safe position. You always want to keep your muzzle in a safe position too. Even if you stumble or fall or something, you want to make sure that your muzzle is pointed in a safe direction or up in the air or definitely away from anybody else. Whenever you are ready to shoot, pay attention to your stance. And in terms of position, safety from a foot standpoint is very important because you're not always going to be on level ground. You always want to make sure that you get your feet spread about shoulder width apart with your left foot pointing towards the, what you think is going to be the area the birds are going to go for and flush and have your front knee bent just a little bit. That'll give you a good range of motion so you're going to be safe with the handling of your firearm from that point. Here is where a lot of accidents happen, crossing a fence. I always want to make sure that my gun is unloaded. If I'm by myself, I unload the gun, I'll set the gun down, cross the fence, then pick the gun up, and then reload it and go from there. If I'm with somebody else, I'll unload it, hand it to that person, and then cross the fence, and then get it back, and then take their unloaded firearm from them and let them do the same. You know, again, accidents can, can happen so quickly, you just need to be aware of those things at all times. One often overlooked piece of safety gear, but very important, is your eyewear. Even if you don't normally wear glasses, it's a good idea to invest in a pair for hunting. Traditionally in a Mern's quail situation, you're in some pretty tight, close cover with some of the oak trees. And, you know, a lot of times you can't control, um, you know, what the shot's going to do. Once it leaves your gun, if you hit an oak tree or something, that BB can bounce back and hit you. So even on a dark day, I like to wear glasses like I have on today, real clear, so I can still see good, but they protect me at all times. And it's just, just a good thing to do anyway uh, to protect yourself. 
And when you're done for the day, don't forget about safely storing your firearm for travel. If you go ahead and unload your gun and either put it in a soft case or a hard case, you're never going to have any problems. And there's really no re reason to have the gun in the, in the truck up, the, up front with you anyway. So I like, I just take the general position that if I've got the gun unloaded in a case, not only that, it's going to keep it clean, it's going to keep it from bumping around. And, you know, besides the safety aspect, it's just going to take care of your firearm as well. When it's all said and done, quail hunting is safer than playing ping pong. That being said, though, it's up to all of us to be aware in the field and follow these simple rules to keep the sport safe. If you're like me, choosing the right gun is a bit confusing. Rob Keck of the National Wild Turkey Federation helps clear the air. So many times over the years when I've taken a new turkey hunter, they came equipped with a gun that was more than what they needed. But I have found day in and day out, if you just take a gun you're comfortable with, you've answered the question on the right turkey gun. It could be a gun of uh, a variety of uses. It can be a gun that you shoot trap or sporting clays with. You now take this shotgun that you normally point and swing through on a moving target, and you're aiming it now like a rifle. A gun that's got a stock that fits perfectly. And they bring the gun up, their cheek fits into the comb of that stock, and they have a level of confidence that they can hit whatever it is they're shooting at. And trying to find a turkey gun that has the right combination of sights for you, whether it's a scope, fiber optic sights, or just open rifle sights, you have to have some level of confidence that you can repeatedly and consistently put that shotgun on that target that you can make a good, clean kill. Someone that is searching for that right turkey gun also has to find the right load that's going to work well on that gun. And it doesn't have to always be the maximum load. In fact, you'll find that a lot of turkey guns will actually perform better with lesser powder weights or uh, a different shot configuration. And a shotgun has to be equipped with a sling. Seems like a turkey hunter always has more than he can carry going into the turkey woods. But when you think about coming out of that woods, that big old gobbler, a sling on that shotgun is a real necessary component to make that hunt so enjoyable. The Roadrunner is one of the most recognizable and misunderstood birds in the Sonoran Desert. So here's a brief look at this sometimes zany bird. Though not confined to the Sonoran Desert, the Roadrunner is as much at home here as any beast. Their home is usually a nest up off the ground in a thick bush. And as this lucky homeowner discovered, they're quite capable of becoming your neighbor. Often, it seems curiously unafraid of humans, trotting up close to peer at us, raising and lowering its mop of a shaggy crest, flipping its long tail about expressively, looking undeniably zany. Not satisfied with the midday sun, the roadrunner gets a head start on the heat by raising the feathers on its back to reveal a dark skin patch. It absorbs the early morning rays and gets its body temperature up to a level suitable for behavior that at times does seem cartoon-like. The most famous bird in the Sonoran Desert, the Roadrunner is also the most fictionalized. Generations of Americans have grown up thinking that roadrunners are purple and crying meep meep as they speed about, always outwitting the coyote. The real roadrunner is impressive. Running in the open, it can reach 15 miles per hour. It can fly a short distance, but it usually doesn't. Clown-like as it may appear to human eyes, the roadrunner is a very effective predator. Gamble's quail may pay scant attention to roadrunners in most seasons, but react violently when they have small young, and with good reason. Given the opportunity, the roadrunner will sneak in and grab a bite-sized baby quail. This relative of the cuckoo family actually hunts snakes, even rattlesnakes and very successfully as well. Lizards, rodents, birds, in fact almost anything small that walks or crawls is fair game for this voracious predator. Beep beep. 
That wraps up another episode of Arizona Wildlife Views. If you'd like more information on anything you've seen tonight, visit our website at azgfd.gov. For producers Carol Lynn and Gary Schaefer, I'm your host, Ian Satter. We'll see you next time.